Uh, Tilly Berlin is the head of curatorial at Science Gallery in Melbourne. Basically, she's a massive nerd. I didn't write that. Curious about the world and everything in it. Her background is in museums, galleries, education, festivals, broadcasting, and research. Originally a microbiologist, Tilly ran from the lab to the ABC, where she discovered a talent for science gossip, talking about other people's science rather than doing her own. <laughs> I really like that one. She is collabor she's a collaborative creature who has curated exhibitions on health, medicine, experimentation, the voice, engineering, sustainability, and different perspectives around mental health. Tilly is delighted by blurring the boundaries between science, art, design, technology, maths, engineering, large-scale batteries powered by human urine, and doing things she's told aren't allowed. I think that's probably the best bio we've had. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, Tilly, welcome again, and the floor is all yours. Ah, oh, thanks, Stephen. Um, okay, so I will get slides. Are they all up? Yeah, all yeah, good. Good to go. Thank you so much for inviting me to come this afternoon. It is an absolute delight to be joining you from across the ditch. Um, so today I want to talk to you about Australia's newest gallery, Science Gallery, a place where we enjoy colliding art and science and everything in between. Um, first off, I want to acknowledge that I'm coming to you from the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Eastern Kulin Nations. And I want to pay my respect to Ani Dai Kerr uh, and other First Nations elders here on Wurundjeri land, both past and present. Uh, and also extend and acknowledge my respect to uh, elders from the lands in which you are watching this from, Aotearoa. And I do that not only because here in Australia, it always was and always will be Aboriginal land, uh, but because all the things I'm gonna talk about today have interdisciplinarity at the heart of taking away barriers between those disciplines and, and blurring those boundaries. And that's not a new practice at all. First Nations peoples have been working and thinking in that frame for over 65,000 years. Uh, and they are the first scientists and the first artists. So today I want to talk to you about radically rethinking how we engage young people with science and art. And one main question that I want to leave with is, can a gallery give agency to young people to inspire social change around us? And so first I want to begin with a quote from Greta Thunberg um, and her youth-led advocacy around climate change. And that is that we must unite behind science, we have to take action, and we have to do the impossible. But how can we take action and unite around science when at the moment 57% of people around the world think that they don't know anything or not much about science? And lots of those studies have shown that to be able to trust in science or institutions around science and their um, advice that they're giving us has a really strong link with if you have studied science and have a connection with uh, what is the scientific method and, and how it is that scientists think and work. And so young people uh, across the board are choosing science less and the other STEM subjects. So STEM being science, technology, engineering and maths. And so how do we inspire young people to be able to understand, connect and come up with innovative solutions of the greatest problems of our time if they are not engaging in sciences in general? And that is where Science Gallery can start to come in to bring a really different way of engaging young people in STEM, STEAM, where you're adding arts into the mix uh, and coming up with solutions. So... I thought I would start with what is Science Gallery. So Science Gallery started about 13 years ago at Trinity College in Dublin. And it was gonna be a space, a porous membrane where the incredible ecosystem of minds and ideas that were happening within the university and the research that was happening could filter outside of the university and connect with people who weren't within that sphere yet. And they wanted to target specifically young people, so 15 to 25 year olds, to try and grab their attention and engage them with research and issues, but in a different way. 
And that way for them was combining and looking at that collision point of arts and science. And it went so well that we turned it into a, an international model. And at the moment we have eight science galleries that are open or due to be open around the world. And one, so this map has seven of them and then there's an extra one it's missing, which is Berlin. So we're in Dublin, London, Melbourne, uh, Bengaluru, Rotterdam, Atlanta, Detroit, and Berlin. So there are all things that bring us together as science galleries. Um, and then we also have our own unique uh, personalities as well as each of our galleries. But we are always looking at that, that collision point of different disciplines. So in Western education for the past century, lots of the structures and the way that it got set up is about separating people and pushing them into something that their skill set seems to fit. So lots of people consider science and maths to be hard subjects and subjects that only if you're um, uh, showing yourself to be intelligent in certain ways that you should be funneled into. Um, and lots of people get funneled into the arts and creative practice if they look creative and curious. And what we're about um, is that they are actually incredibly close collaborators, the arts and the sciences. And they're all these skills that come useful in, in across the board of those subjects are things like cre curiosity, creativity, uh, problem solving skills. And so uh, this is another reason why here in Australia and probably in New Zealand as well, young people, young women and girls uh, and also gender diverse humans uh, are staying away from the sciences because it doesn't get, um, it doesn't have such creativity getting pushed through it. So at Science Gallery, we're about shifting the dial on that and really engaging young people in how creative the sciences can be because we truly have enormous subjects to tackle and we've got to come up with innovative solutions um, to things that are happening in the world. Young people, as I said, are at the heart of everything that we do. Our target age range is between 15 and 25. Everyone else is welcome to come in and experience the gallery, but the way that we come up with ideas of what subjects we're going to tackle and what works get involved, get into the exhibitions that we show at the gallery and what kind of events we're running, all of that is done in consultation with people within that age frame. And there's a lot of reasons around that. Lots of it, uh, one main reason is that for people who are age 30 and over, there are lots of cultural institutions that are courting their attention and, and, um, and their wallet. So lots of museums and galleries being that you need to pay to get into them, especially for big blockbuster shows. And at the other end of the dial, there are lots of science centres and hands-on activities and places that you can go to with a young family where children are welcomed in and it's a playful approach. But within that age range of 15 to 25, lots of galleries and museums find it quite a scary um, age to try and connect with. Uh, and so that is why Science Gallery has stepped in worldwide to try and engage and truly connect authentically with people within that age range by including them in those decision making as well. So here um, is the building in the background um, on my background slide here, but it's Melbourne Connect. So we are part of the University of Melbourne and all the science galleries around the world are embedded within their own tertiary institution as well. Uh, and we are part of this innovation district here in Melbourne that's just been built right just outside the, the CBD heart. We opened our doors earlier this year. That was supposed to happen about a year before, but this tiny thing called COVID came along and um, we tried to open four times, I think. And it became quite a joke because um, every time we announced our opening day, um, in the week running up to it, the city of Melbourne would go into lockdown. <laughs> and so people started to be able to predict when the next um, wave was going to come through based on when the city, based on when we announced our new dates. But we finally did open in January uh, 2022. And I wanted to show you just a few images of the space so that you know uh, what it's going to look like and expect when you come over and visit. So the entrance experience to Science Gallery already frames that this isn't a normal 
museum and gallery, that we really are breaking the mould of what it means to walk into an institution like this and who's welcome and how they connect with the ideas inside. On our entrance way, we have over 230 digital bricks. So these are glass bricks that then have uh, small screens, digital screens embedded into the back of each one that are each controllable of their own and they can um, move into swarming behaviours and have content running across each other. So in this way, we can connect with students at the university who can program uh, particular works to come up on those bricks. Oh, and they're also touchable. So they will respond to touch and you can change what's being displayed on those bricks uh, throughout the seasons. This is a photograph of the gallery space itself, because one of the things that we made sure was front and centre was sustainability. So speaking to that target age range in which climate change, action and sustainability is such a huge part uh, of what the, their values of what they want to do in the near future. We wanted to make sure that we weren't a gallery that was building lots of things to knock it down and put it in a skip at the end. So as you look up there, you can see, you can see the ceiling system a little bit po poking through those curtains. So we have these incredible movable walls that can come and dance through the gallery and then connect in and we can make smaller spaces because as you'll see, from this next slide, this is the gallery empty uh, from the other end, and it is a vast cavernous space, um, a space with lots of natural light, which is really different um, and incredibly privileged, um, unlike other museums and galleries that really do need to care for and think about the preservation of particular objects in their collection. At Science Gallery, because we are a participatory cutting edge gallery of collaborative works. They aren't historic objects. They're not objects that need to have consideration about the light impact on them that other um, galleries and museums really need to have at the forefront of their display capabilities. You can see that movable track running in the ceiling and on the floor, all those incredible, it's a metallic floor, so it's magnetic. We can stick things to it. All of the power and the data runs not only in the ceiling, but underneath those floors so we can drill them up and really position anything throughout the whole gallery. As I mentioned, young people are at the heart of everything we do. These are four of our mediators. So that's human beings that are in gallery. Anyone who we employ to work inside the gallery on the floor is between the ages of 15, really 18, for this group, 18 to 28. Uh, lots of them are university students um, and some of them are not in the university sector at all, but that's because the peer-to-peer -peer model really focuses on how to grab young people's attention and engage them in conversation to shift their mindset or have them be open to different ways of thinking. And what research has shown time and time again is that connecting with people who are the same age or slightly older, aspirational. Um, so with all of our school groups who come in, they all of their educators in the gallery are in their early to mid twenties. Uh, and that means that they are much more res uh, receptive to the ideas and connecting with what the topics are within our shows. And embedding young people in that ideation and in that development of the shows mean that we're really tackling issues that are important to that group. And so that's the future of these are some examples of shows that have happened in science gallery around the world. So that's the future of food. Um, of course, shows about climate change and carbon and, of course, technology. So about human bias being embedded within artificial intelligence around the ethics of artificial intelligence and how far we're willing to go. So I mentioned at the top the quote from Greta Thunberg about um, needing to take action. And truly, when we talk to the young people who are connected with us as our advisory boards, taking action on climate change is consistently in the top five things of issues that are uh, providing anxiety and worries for young people in the current age. Our last show that we presented uh, before our building opened was Disposable. Uh, and this was a pop-up month-long festival that happened throughout Melbourne um, in 2019. 
I wanted to show you a couple of the works and give you a, a feel for how science gallery shows are in person. So one of the one of my favourite works within that show was Eel Trap, which was our inaugural uh, artist in residence program, where we get intergenerational knowledge to connect and passing down um, ways of working, ways of thinking, and knowledges from one generation to the next. In this work, we worked with Marie Clark um, and Mitch Marnie. So Marie Clark is an incredibly renowned First Nations uh, artist. And she works with her nephew, Mitch Marnie, who's within our age range and within our community to build this eel trap. So a 10 metre long eel trap that was um, created, started off in their backyard here, was a photo that I took when the whole Science Gallery team went to start and help them, um, but then connected into an art gallery and actually, instead of me talking about it, I'm going to play you a two minute video and let me know if it's too jerky and I can send the link to watch after. But it just is a nice way of hearing about the project. My name is Mitch Marnie. Um, I'm a young Bunurang artist. I'm the artist in residence for Science Gallery. As part of my residency, I'm building an 11 metre eel trap as part of the disposable pop-up gallery, all out of river reeds and biodegradable materials. My name's Luke West. I'm a power man from Tasmania, and I'm lucky enough to have a job as a mediator with Science Gallery. So the site where the Gunditjmara people live, which is called Bujbim, recently got recognised at a UNESCO World Heritage Site and that makes it the first World Heritage Site to be recognised purely for its Indigenous value. So the whole idea behind the work is thinking about how we deal with our waste in Australia and thinking about Indigenous attitudes towards waste and sustainable living. Annie Marie, she's my great auntie and We've been working together pretty well full time this year on all different kinds of projects. It was actually her who put the whole project um, on the table in front of me one afternoon and said, would you like to do that? This, we could do it together. I think working on a 10 metre river reed eel trap, which I've never done before and nor has Mitch, to bring that together at Footscray Community Arts Centre. As you can see, there's been huge amounts of um, community coming in and being part of the whole process, which is fantastic. We've had everyone from four or five year olds to you know adults, people who are working on their own artwork and have time off come to volunteer. We're using the eel trap as a key technology used by a lot of Indigenous people as a sustainable fishing practice. It will degrade, it will wash down, it will flow out to all the places it needs to connect with. These plants are also the filters and it's like the lifeblood of the Eastern Kulin Nation that flows through this beautiful part of our country. So that's one glorious little look into look into one of the exhibits that happened. And that disposable program was the first time that we as a gallery opened up and actually included young people in the curatorial decision making about what shows were about. We'd done some pop-ups before where the team was still making those decisions, um, but it was an incredible opportunity to look around and see whose voices weren't there and invite three young people to join me in and as our director in decision making about, yeah, what works got in. And so it went so well that year of changing what sub themes we were going to do, what works got into the show that uh, we've actually increased the number of young people and decreased the number of old people uh, because I don't want, I know it'll shock you, but I'm not actually within the art, art, the target age range. And so making sure that the voice of those young people are there uh, makes all of the shows that we do richer and more challenging and funnier than it could have ever been with just me uh, and Ryan, my director. So another one that I know I mentioned in my bio and everyone gets pretty excited about is Urinatron. 
so an artist came to us uh, for the disposable program and said he wanted to on a plinth he wanted to put a beautiful glass structure Gaspar Bebe wanted to fill that structure with urine to really drive home to people what a that it should be revered that it's a valuable resource and it should be revered um, and then filter that water and offer it to visitors to drink uh, science gallery you know we were like great idea but let's connect you with someone who is really interested in that topic as well but has a whole different life experience to you in a way of approaching things so here at the university of melbourne we found professor peter scales who is a chemical engineer and lifelong um thinker about water treatment and processing and how you plan a city and what a city functioning well looks like and we put them in a zoom room together and suddenly sparks were flying because of course when you get an engineer the first thing they want it to do is to be functioning and working and so began the journey to create a glass shipping container that was an enormous battery really powered right here by human urine and so students on the campus and anyone walking past could contribute to this work by contributing your urine including the vice chancellor who contributed his urine to this project and once you had done that you could plug your phone in and power your phone from the microbial fuel cells that were creating electricity uh, from within the work and this is an example of the kind of work that we do at science gallery and and how we're trying to grab young people's attention in saying that we'd, it, within this there is a plethora of interesting science facts that you can connect with but actually that combination of art and science is grabbing the attention and and putting really challenging questions in front of you for example when we filtered this water using a filtration system that turned the urine into water that was cleaner than anything that would come out of a tap would have less pollutants would have less anything else in it than good old h2o it was still it's illegal to not only drink that water but it's illegal to use that water to water plants um, which was part of what we wanted to show of how legislation and it is so far behind the scientific and engineering skills and thinking that we have within our countries. Um, and so that started a panel discussion and a, and a way of changing the way that we think about how we need to tackle these issues. Uh, Hot and Bothered is an online youth symposium led by young people from science galleries all around the world where they come together online to do workshops and talks and figure out again creative solutions um, to the problems in front of us and how we can work together um, about tackling climate change and its effects when we talk to young people mental health was another huge uh, topic that needed to be addressed and that they wanted to connect with in different and interesting ways and that was before the pandemic in which now it's an even more um, important topic for everyone and so the show that we actually opened with here at science gallery um, at the start of this year so those old dates is from when we tried to open several times last year but we opened in January this year with mental so an exhibition that was looking at different perspectives of mental health and that had young people with lived experience of mental health here making those decisions with us and guiding what the exhibition was going to be about because primarily it was about how we are all on different mental health journeys but those mental health journeys are not equal so about opening up people's perspectives and understanding about different ways of being different ways of speaking to yourself and others how it is that you can recognize uh, and take ownership over your emotional mental state i just want to show you a couple of works from that show so this is a work by a phd student here in melbourne called nina rajak it's called mirror ritual and in this work you step up to the mirror and it there is a, a emotional recognition software behind the mirror that when you are in front of it assesses what it thinks that you are feeling and from that assessment of what it thinks you're feeling it composes a poem uniquely for you in that moment and displays it on the mirror in front of you and so with that it is trying to develop and give you more words and more ways of expressing ways 
of your emotions that you're holding inside. But also it's a really important moment to reflect on whether um, that AI has any idea about what you're feeling on the inside because another challenge with young people is being able to crack open that um, myth that uh, artificial intelligence or uh, computer algorithms have a knowledge or have when they come out with something that that is the right answer. Um, so being able to adjust young people into realising that humans make this technology and therefore it has inherent biases that we cannot program out. That said, Mirror Ritual was an incredibly big hit and members of the team and audience members would come back to get a poem each day and see how that was tracking and progressing with how they felt as a human throughout the show, which is lovely. This is an example of some of our mediators who are young people working and being the heart and soul of the gallery. Lots of those young people, as I said, are at university and bring this enormous knowledge um, from their own experience and expertise, being PhD students in physics, being animal biologists, being drone engineers. It's an incredible space to come in, have a conversation and learn from someone who has a very different history from you. Um, conscious of time, the impact. So um, we had all sorts of ideas about what we wanted Science Gallery to be and what we were hoping that impact was going to be, not only for our visitors, but also for those mediators, those young people who work in gallery. Uh, and we got, just got a, a fairly significant audience evaluation survey back last week, and I wanted to share just a couple of those key findings which warmed my heart immensely which was that for our for all target age ranges, we were 96% 96, 96 um, extremely satisfied or very satisfied from our audience, um, which was heartwarming. And with the um, survey company said that it's not actually possible to get any bigger than that because there are always going to be people who are uh, not particularly satisfied, which I also welcome. I uh, look forward to conversations with people who hate it. The wonderful thing with Science Gallery where you're bringing different disciplines together is that there will always be a cohort of scientists who think that there is no science within it uh, and it shouldn't be called science anything. And there will always be a cohort of artists who think that it is not um, artistically rigorous enough and not for them. And that is an incredibly exciting, great place to be especially when you're making people feel uncomfortable and question uh, the ideas in which they frame what is okay and what isn't okay and, and the ethics of who gets to make those decisions. One particular stat that I haven't got here that I absolutely love is that 86% of people reported that they had conversations within Science Gallery that they wouldn't have had anywhere else. And I think that at a time where we need 21st century skills of collaboration and being able to connect with people who have very different viewpoints from you and different life experience um, is a really great place to be. People, young people wanted to also reported to us that they really wanted to explore the ethics of technology. And so the show that we opened last week is Swarm. Are we hardwired to be part of the pack? And this show is open until December and has all kinds of participatory research projects and interactive um, installations where you can truly engage from nanobots to enormous machines that will respond to your body and movement trees that are roaming around on robots built by our engineering department um, where you get to listen to soundtracks. This particular work is called Sentient Forest and you can listen to intraspecies communication. So recordings of trees and the ways that they are uh, communicating with each other through the soil. Um, so in answer to that question that I posed at the start, can a gallery give agency to young people to promote social change? The answer is absolutely. We are enjoying doing it here at Science Gallery and we look forward to continuing to do it into the far future. Thank you so much. That is the end of my talk. 
Well, that was uh, absolutely uh, fascinating. I'm just going to add my self in there. Thank you, Tilly. That was uh, that really was um, fascinating. I've written down a whole bunch of questions, as I always do. Uh, Mick has some really tough questions for you as well. Not at all. Which ones do you want to start with? Well, I'll just say first to, uh, if you have a question for Tilly um, about what she's talked about or anything else, uh, please do put it in the chat and uh, we'll just have a, a short question time now. So Mick, let's, let's see what he, so he's saying, uh, do you have traveling exhibitions between the different science galleries as well as designing your own? Yes, the answer to your question is yes. Um, so because we are a, a genuine network of science galleries, the eight of us um, are really open to sharing exhibitions between galleries free of charge um, or introducing each other to artists and collaborators as well. Um, and so, for example, that's happened with our disposable show. A number of the works went over to Science Gallery London and were part of their show, which was called Plastics. And one thing that we see time and time again is that young people on this side of the world are not that much different from young people on the other side of the world. So when those science galleries are talking about themes, the same big issues are coming up and that's of ethics, of AI, of mental health, of climate crisis, all of the things that our young people are anxious about and want to find solutions to are consistent. And so when Mental was on, for example, uh, Science Gallery London had a show called On Edge about anxiety and depression. Um, and Science Gallery Detroit had another show called The Science of Grief about dealing with the grief of pandemic, dealing with the grief of loss, dealing with climate loss, all kinds, dealing with loss of your family. Um, all number of things. So, uh, yeah, we do have come up with our own themes and we do share. Next week, I will be travelling to Singapore because Mental, the show that we just closed here in Melbourne, will be opening it at Art Science Museum in Singapore. And with that show, I wholeheartedly worked with their curator to, and they are taking maybe 80% of the show. And then we have worked to recurate that and select six local Singaporean and Malaysian artists to come and go into the show and bring a wealth of other um, questions and propositions and ideas. Uh, so yes, we get traveling shows and we also co-curate and recurate things to have a better local context of wherever they're going. Because it doesn't really help to plonk up a whole bunch of Melbourne ideas and issues and put it down somewhere else. There needs to be a discussion and a, and a forefront of the voice of young people of that area. Great. That kind of uh, segues into one of my questions was, you talked a bit about sustainability and not wanting to create a building that's torn down and put into a skip at the end of it. What happens at the end of an exhibition? You've just said that sometimes they go off to mm -hmm. other galleries. Yep. Um, do you have an archive or do you ascend some of the, like the urinator battery, uh, urinatron battery, you know, what do you do with that stuff at the end? Yeah, so for the um, mental show, we did pack a lot of that stuff up into a shipping container and ship it across. But for example, all the curtains that you saw, um, we that was to provide each exhibit with its own space. But the way we got the fabric was that our designer contacted a whole bunch of big fabric companies and Kavadrat, who are this enormous fabric company, sent us samples of all the things that was their offcuts, their end of, where they only had, you know, 50 metres of something. And in the, the quantities that they deal with, that's nothing. Or they only had 10 metres of this. And, and what we actually made was an incredibly beautiful curtaining system from all those offcuts that they were going to throw into um, landfill. Mm. And so they were really happy. We were really happy. Um, so there are ways that we continue to... Um, find ways so that we're not and throwing things in the skip at the end and at the end we also have this amazing fabricator who if we send anything back that's plastic if we send anything back that's metal they are melting that down and then recreating the new things for us if needs be out of that but then you know boxes and chairs and all those sort of things we make once and we keep and continue to adapt and all those walls we paint 
we drill stuff into, we knock a hole into, all of that stuff is is possible to really make it not a white cube gallery, but something that's adaptable and sustainable. Okay, there's a few questions popping up here. Were people able to print their poem in the mirror display? Um, I was thinking of that too. No printing, but you'll never guess, very Instagrammable. So people would stand there and take photos of themselves and their faces um, in the mirror. But, yeah, it was not hooked up to a printer, sadly. Yep. I mean, that seems like a, an incredible, you lost some light. I did. <laughs> I turned the lights out. I think I was sitting still for too long. It thought that the sea, all the lights get turned out if it thinks no humans oh, are in here. Okay, Kate's asking, do you connect at any level with science fairs that are run in high schools? Oh, so yeah, one, thank you, Kate. One big thing that I didn't mention was that we actually have a, a whole um, a school that runs within us. It's not quite a school. They're called tech schools, which here in Victoria are a way of connecting our uh, uh, secondary school sector to hubs that have all sorts of expertise and equipment that schools can't traditionally have, things like 3D printers, things like drones um, and other uh, electronic incredibleness. So we have a whole education team here who are accepting um, visits from school children from across Melbourne and Victoria and indeed the world um, to do workshops, hands-on workshops, and teacher development where they really are putting that artistic and creative twist on all of the science and engineering and technology subjects that students need to do. So yeah, school groups are a huge part of our audience. Jean is asking, uh, do you have a profile of the number of ages of the visitors? We do indeed. So at that huge report that we just got, um, I actually have in my hot little hand here, and we have visitors who are visiting all the way from uh, from one up to 85 plus. So about 40% of our visitors are within, for mental, were within our target age range. Maybe it was bigger than that. But um, each one of the criteria about what sort of a gallery it was and how you feel about it, um, are then split out across those age groups. So we're able to look at um, how much of a positive response we're getting from young people as opposed to um, over 65, 75s and um, everything in between. So at the moment, it's a rich audience from across all age ranges, which I'm delighted about and we welcome everyone into. It's just with the topics and the complaints the ones that interest me more is within that target age range of 15 to 25. I suppose it's a great facility to encourage intergenerational connections as well. Absolutely. Intergenerational knowledge sharing and connection is so deeply important now more than ever. Mm -hmm. Good. Mick has asked, and I wrote this down as well, uh, funding. Where does the funding come from? Yep. Um, so multi-streamed, because we are part of the University of Melbourne, that means that the uh, a large part of our funding comes from the university itself. Um, that, that means that we're involved in those annual and three yearly setting out of what it is that you want to achieve and what strategically we are connecting into the university's grand plan and vision which is glorious for us because as a university who truly is looking to engage young people with different ideas and to create a space where people who perhaps didn't see university as a place for them might have that opinion shifted, um, we fit beautifully within that strategic framework. Yeah. On top of that, we have enormously transformative donations from, from philanthropic um, collaborators. So Peter and Ruth McMullen are human beings who gave us um, $4 million to finish the build and are deeply supportive of all of these ventures which are about creating space and being welcoming to women and girls and to gender diverse humans within what are typically and more traditionally focused towards young men, uh, careers of the sciences, engineering, technology, because it is only by bringing in these different perspectives that we truly are gonna shift the dial on what those professions and the innovations that could come out of them look like. And then we have other corporate sponsors like uh, Toyota supports our First Nations um, led 
uh, design workshops, so design and technology workshops, um, all the way through to chartered accountants who will be um, supporting a whole bunch of nights that we have as well. So university funded, connected internationally, supported by sponsors and partners throughout. Good. Okay. Jean's asking, is it free entry? I think you might have mentioned free entry. Yeah, absolutely. Free entry to every show. Also free entry to every public program. Um, I'm just in the in the spot of trying to figure out how we might shift and change that so that we can keep it free to young people, but um, perhaps start to charge people who would like to come, not to the exhibition, but if there are workshops for example, that only have a small number of spaces, how do we make that available to our target audience, but also be able to extend that to people um, outside of that as well. So that's a uh, something that we are grappling with. But yes, still free, free always. How far in advance are you planning? So oh, how yeah. long does it take to put together something like Swarm, for, a, for example? Um, generally about 18 months to a year. Um, so we are, yeah, so we are always planning ahead. I know the shows and about 70% of the works that will be in the two shows for next year, which the first half of the year, the show is called Breaking the Binaries, about breaking binary thinking around all kinds of topics, but with genders at the heart of it, sexuality, race, um, yep, so that'll be an excellent topic. And then the one after that is Dark Matters. So so we're already well in into production on on those two, and at the moment we're just starting to figure out what might be happening in 2024. So about 18 months. Okay, okay. Uh, one last question. There's no more questions in the chat, but I've just got. And this is the first one I wrote down because you talked about the purpose of the gallery, mm -hmm. um, and it sort of got me thinking about the long term impact of young people not choosing science. Yep. which to me would be um, quite a significant impact on society uh, if, you, if you've if you got less and less people getting into science long-term, I, I suppose. Yeah, a huge, a huge impact. Um, and so thankfully our audience surveys are indeed also showing that that is changes when someone comes into science gallery, they're 72% um, have said that it has shifted how they think about the possibility of their future career choices being possible and interesting within the science, engineering, technology, maths. Um, so agreed, it is a terrifying prospect of, especially when we are at the precipice of such a technological revolution and such control that will come from that technology and the data that comes into enormous corporations. Mm -hmm. And so being able to have a technologically and scientifically literate society who are passionate and interested in where that line is, where we draw that line and what we're okay with is incredibly important. Mm, absolutely. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Tilly. I'm going to hand over to uh, Kirsten. If I can find her in the list here. Here she is. Oh, Kirsten, turn your uh, video on. There you are. Hang on a sec. Sorry, I was, <laughs> I was far away from the camera. Um, I was surrounded by people, you see, and they all scattered when, uh, when it was my turn. Thanks so much, Tilly, for taking your time today to speak to us. I know you're on your lunch break, aren't you? So um, thanks for giving us your time. Uh, I am so pleased that your building has opened. Um, it sounds like it was a bit of a journey to get there. So thank goodness that it's opened up. And it's such a beautiful building that you have. Um, I love the idea of the digital bricks and people, you know, holding their phones up and, and seeing interesting things and that you're able to change that. It's pretty amazing. So, um, yeah, you'll be very pleased that you're situated in your building now. Um, the other thing I thought was kind of funny was I was looking, I loved your the eel um, trap, but I th a few of us in the room said, wow, they got big eels in Australia. Oh, <laughs> So it wasn't a trap eels, it was a trap garbage I didn't in the Maribyrnong so. River. But yep, yep, they're massive eels. I was like, everything's bigger in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah, that was pretty cool. 
Uh, the other the other thing you were talking about that seemed really fascinating was the mirror and um, being able to look at it and it read your emotions and then write a wee poem for you. I think I'd probably be going back to it each, you know, every couple of hours going, how am I feeling now? <laughs> how am I feeling now? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was cool. Um, but yeah, when you put up your survey results as well, I thought that's really a fantastic impact that you your, you and your team are having. So um, yeah, thanks for sharing uh, all that you've shared today. And it'd be I, next time I'm, I'm in Melbourne, I will definitely be coming in. Even though I'm not in the demographic, um, I'll still come in and say hi. <laughs> Please do. Everyone is welcome. I want to repeat that again. It's just an incredible privilege that we can focus on who we're trying to target and please. Yeah. Um, but everyone is welcome to come in and experience it. Yeah. You might get a lot of people from Wellington coming and asking for Tilly. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, right. It's happening already. Yeah. Bring, it, bring it on. Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. It's fantastic. And uh, all the best with the Swarm exhibition. I'd love to see that, actually. I think that's going to be very uh, exciting. And uh, all the best for the, for the rest of the year. Thank you again, Tilly. Have a lovely afternoon, gang. Bye.